Uh, thank you everybody for coming to the AGN International Seminar Series today. And I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Jin Lu is here. And uh, Jin Lu, she's an associate professor uh, in astronomy at um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, she got her bachelor's degree in physics uh, from Tsinghai University. <laughs> I'm not sure I pronounced that right. Um, and then she went on to get her PhD in astrophysical sciences at Princeton University. And uh, before joining her current position, she was a NASA Einstein Fellow at Harvard and then a Hubble Fellow at UCLA. And uh, Jin is really an expert in so many different uh, areas of AGN studies, um, including dual and binary AGNs. And she's really you know, done a lot of uh, uh, really pioneering work in the hunt for uh, dual AGNs uh, at closer and clo closer pair separations and exploiting large scale uh, surveys such as the dark energy survey and coming up with innovative ways using time domain uh, data to hunt for uh, really close uh, dual and uh, binary AGNs. Um, so she's really had a, a, an impressive slew of projects uh, and observing time on state-of-the-art facilities, including Gemini um, and recently James, James Webb. Um, so, you know, I'm really excited by her work and I've followed it closely and I'm, I'm delighted that she's here to speak to us today. So I will turn it over to you, Shin. Thank you. Thank you so much for the extremely kind introduction. And thanks again to everyone for coming to my talk. Uh, so please feel free to stop me and ask questions. I'll also try to be brief so that we'll have more time at the end for a discussion. Uh, so uh, today I'm really excited to give you a brief tour about dual and binary supermassive black holes. So that, that was uh, you know, very clearly explained. Fantastic. Uh, so for dual, uh, usually, I refer to kiloparsec and subkiloparsec separations before a pair of black holes become as a binary. Um, and this is a field traditionally driven by theory, but in recent years, uh, attracted a lot of excitement in the observational community as well. So I'd like to give you a little bit of flavor as why that is uh, what's being accomplished and the outstanding questions to be resolved. Uh, so first, I want to thank my collaborators and in particular the students being highlighted down here. Uh, and in particular, uh, Tony is on the job market this year. Uh, so if you are, uh, you know, happen to be on uh, the higher committee, uh, so please, please consider him. You won't regret it. Okay, so uh, to prepare us for the tour, here's an outline. So I'll start with why and then give you a, a little bit of insight scope um, what we really know about these uh, system, uh, how we go about finding them. And in particular, I talk about how we use temporal information to break the resolution limit, which is the uh, major uh, bottleneck of uh, observational searches. And I'll finish by um, a summary of what we expect next. Uh, so first, why uh, binary or do supermassive black holes? Um, so let's start from our backyard. And this is just to remind you that our own Milky Way uh, is on a direct collision course with Andromeda. So the two will merge in about 4 billion years. So we'd better be prepared for it. Um, but personally, I think it's going to be the most amazing uh, scene ever. And hopefully by the, the end of my talk, you all agree with me. Um, but uh, so that's, you know, start with the very basics, just about every galaxy the size of our own Milky Way or larger contains a supermassive black hole at the center. Galaxies frequently merge within our hierarchical universe. Uh, so these two simple premises suggest that binaries should be common. So they uh, provide this verification for our model of structural formation. Uh, now, when two galaxies with cold dark matter halos merge, uh, the usual uh, conventional picture is that dynamical friction from the halo will drain the energy from the black holes, and they will spiral into the central few parsecs of the merger remnant becoming a binary. But how efficiently they actually merge on these subgalactic scales depend on the unknown nature of dark matter. 
so their abundance actually uh, really depends on the uh, particle nature of dark matter uh, uh, and um, uh, therefore provides a, an empirical constraint uh, on that. So last but and certainly not least, if the spiral continues to even smaller separations until the decay time um, due to gravitational radiation becomes shorter than the Hubble time, the two will merge. Uh, you know, this is definitely, I think, one of the most ex exciting aspect, uh, you know, in the in the next decade or so. Um, you know, the in spiral and the merger of uh, these supermassive black holes could be detectable by uh, ground-based pulsar time arrays and space-based interferometers, respectively. respectively. And, uh, and, you know, I think this topic is uh, especially interesting given the, you know, the, the recent LIGO events and the, uh, you know, uh, higher and higher uh, limits from the pulsar time arrays as they increase their you know, some sensitivity and sample size, um, you know, but you, you may wonder, you know, we already have LIGO binaries, why do we actually need these supermassive uh, binary systems? There are many reasons from a gravitational wave perspective, uh, which I won't go into detail about, but the, the reason I want to highlight here is that unlike those LIGO stellar mass binaries, these supermassive binaries are um, commonly expected to have a gas-rich environment, making them the prime target for uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So, um, and that's uh, enough for the good news, and uh, here come the bad news, okay? But before I continue, uh, any questions? Okay, great. So again, please feel free to stop me um, just just in case I, you know, I, I go too far. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think there are still a lot of uncertainty between, you know, a galaxy merger all the way to, uh, you know, a pair of supermassive black holes already, uh, uh, you know, emitting gravitational waves. And it, it's really a, a long uh, way, a lot of hoops to jump through. Uh, first, galaxy mergers don't necessarily mean binary black holes, and this is because, uh, you know, the occupation function, which is the fraction of galaxies that actually contain a massive black hole at the center, is actually unknown, especially for smaller galaxies at higher reaches. Uh, so what's um, being uh, illustrated here is this, you know, the, the occupation function, um, you know, uh, from this, this recent NICE annual review paper. So for context, our own Milky Way is way off the chart. And you can see there's still significant uncertainty uh, in both in observations and, and in theory shown by these shaded regions. Uh, I won't go into details here, but uh, you know, just a uh, highlight of some of the work done by my uh, grad students, Colin and Gabby here. So they have a, a, a new paper coming out, uh, hopefully in the next month or so. Uh, so please watch out in the archive. Uh, in which, so he used uh, the dark energy survey data to try and constrain the occupation function of dwarf uh, galaxies almost down to 10 to the seven uh, in stellar mass and finding evidence, um, you know, uh, for discriminating between these seed, um, seeding, different seeding models. Okay, and also uh, I want to highlight the work done by uh, Franklin Wang, which is an undergrad student um, Franklin is also on the job market today. So any you know, grad, graduate program, so please uh, watch out for his application. Um, and the second, even if you, you, know, you have two galaxies both containing supermassive black holes, it doesn't actually mean that you're gonna have a efficient merger. And this is because as we already uh, mentioned that the uh, inspiring uh, efficiency actually on Subgalactic scales depend on the unknown um, particle nature of dark matter. So, in some of the models, you you may even have this bottleneck not later on, but actually early on. Uh, you know, after two galaxies merge. So, uh, and this is um, you know a, a major uncertainty here. Uh, what that means is that you know the sub kiloparsec 
separation regime where we find these dual AGN, for example, is extremely important because their abundance can be used to constrain that directly. Okay, and uh, uh, you know, finally, after a binary is formed, dynamical friction will be less efficient, and this is the, the uh, you know the very famous final parset bottleneck. I'm sure you probably already heard uh, heard about them. Uh, so, but I, I think the good news is that uh, perhaps there are uh, you know possible ways to shrink them uh, so quickly that gravitational waves can take over, so that they can be observed by you know, PTAs and leads that in future. Um, but the, but the, you know, the, the question is exactly how efficiently and how common this process will happen is still unknown. So, um, you know, from uh, all of these um, uh, discussion, I, I think that the main takeaway message from this is that galaxy mergers don't necessarily mean black hole mergers. This is not the problem I should emphasize unless you want to detect gravitational waves. Okay, so our goal here is to find them on these multiple uh, scales to be able to piece together a coherent picture of their formation and evolution. Okay, so before I uh, go into any details, I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the, the recent progress uh, due to the, these large scale surveys. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm showing you the, the known examples of these, uh, you know, early poster childs. So these are the uh, proto, uh, typical examples of either dual AGNs on large scales or binary uh, AGNs. So there is only one confirmed case and a bunch of candidates from these um, periodic or quasi-periodic uh, signals. Um, but I think the thing that I want to highlight is the problem with these um, early uh, examples is that they were all serendipitous discoveries and they seem to be rare, but uh, they are hard to resolve, especially uh, except in the most nearby galaxies. Um, while they are great to study in detail, we don't actually know, you know how common they are, do they? actually prefer some kind of special host galaxies, for example, because we don't have that uh, um, sample statistics to answer these kind of questions. I want you to take a mental picture of this, um, this uh, stamp collecting uh, graph, because on the next slide, I'm gonna show you the progress uh, made in the last uh, decade or so. So thank, again, thanks to these big surveys, we, we now have see you know, significant uh, progress in accumulating the examples of these, uh, especially these dual agent system that are you know, still, still separate uh, uh, enough for us to actually resolve them, right? So, um, and uh, we, you know, thanks to these big surveys, we come to realize that these dual agent system, they are common and their frequency on large scales uh, you know, is broadly consistent with these uh, uh, canonical hierarchical models. Uh, the problem with this uh, still is that, and I will uh, come back to this graph later on, is that you notice there is still a big gap, um, you know, between the, the kiloparsec and the scale where gravitational wave can take over. So that's roughly, uh, you know, correspond to about a hundred threshold radii, uh, you know, for a rough number. Um, and, uh, and this particular graph is not uh, actually extending to, uh, you know, any substantial redshift where you would expect a lot of mergers to happen, right? Because, uh, you know, typically we expect the local universe to be rather dull perhaps. And the, you know, a lot of the, the uh, uh, really exciting uh, activities, mergers um, have already happened perhaps uh, in the earlier universe. Um, so our goal with these ongoing efforts is to be able to fill that gap. Okay, so before going on to, uh, you know, any details, I wanted to give you a more sense of scale. So this slide basically summarizes the different emission, uh, you know, coming from different distance to the central black hole. 
depending on your skill of interest, you know, the, you know, th this is a blessing because you can choose different tracers or markers. And um, I'm just highlighting the uh, corresponding facilities at the bottom. Uh, and in particular, I want to highlight the work uh, that's being done with Gaia, uh, Hubble on subgalactic uh, scales. And if we have time at the end, I, I think I will also cover some of the um, uh, even smaller scale work uh, that we're doing with the Dark Energy Survey, okay? And uh, so before uh, moving on, I'd like to make the analogy between the search of dual and binary supermassive black holes with uh, detecting binary stars and exoplanets. Um, so as examples, I'm just showing you the cartoon illustrations of the, uh, you know, the few major exoplanet or binary star detection techniques. And, uh, you know, the reason is that I, I think we can borrow inspiration from every technique. So that's, uh, you know, briefly, perhaps briefly go over them so they, that you can have a global picture. It, it'll be a really broad brush thing. And um, uh, one thing I, I wanted to highlight is that uh, in particular astrometry, right? So um, not very, perhaps not very useful yet for uh, exoplanet, but it turns out that it, it's a very useful tool for, for us. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll come to that um, in a second. And uh, so let's move along the merger sequence, okay? Uh, so first on galaxies, and larger scales, we use direct imaging to find mergers, and particularly those with both nuclei uh, being active to identify dual AGN. Okay, so um, at this stage, you know it's it's very great because uh, you know you can use uh, you know your favorite survey data you want, you know for example maybe Wise, um, so that you you can also be sensitive to obscure systems which. Perhaps a lot of these mergers are, you know, really dusty, gas rich. So um, maybe a high fraction will be in obscure AGN. But for the remaining part of my talk, I, I'm going to be uh, focusing on an obscure population where at least one of the black holes is a broad line AGN. Okay, and that's uh, just by design. It's a selection bias that would we would like to correct for later on, but. Uh, for the moment, uh, so that's just focused on that broad line population, okay? So moving along the merger sequence, for these subgalactic pairs that may be unresolved in these ground-based images, we can use the velocity splitting in their narrow emission lines. So um, H beta or three, for example, which uh, trace ionized gas in the narrow line region around each black hole, similar to detecting spectroscopic binary stars. Now, higher resolution imaging and the uh, spatially resolved spectroscopy are still uh, needed and obtained to actually confirm these candidates because the velocity splitting could also be due to other mechanisms such as outflows or a just a rotating disk of gas, okay? Moving along the merger sequence further, uh, when we get down to subparsec scales where pair of black hole has already become a bound binary, we can monitor the velocity offset between the broad emission lines uh, with respect to the system velocity characterized by the narrow emission line, tracing the host galaxy um, uh, and the, uh, uh, you know, the, syst the systematic redshift for the whole system, right? So this technique is, you know, sometimes referred to as the radio velocity monitoring technique is very similar to the radio velocity method of exoplanet detection. Um, but the, the difficulty here is that the typical binary orbital period is too long to cover. Um, so we only have candidates and uh, you know, statistical constraints on this population. Now, Future near-infrared interferometry, such as with the gravity plus instruments, may be able to actually um, detect the proper motion of these subparsec binary systems, but they're gonna be really restricted to only uh, you know, the brightest candidates uh, among them all, okay? And finally, um, 
even smaller scales, uh, you know, perhaps two milliparsec scales before gravitational waves take over, we can use Likert variability um, as characteristic from either the circumbinary equation um, uh, modulation or due to kinematic effects such as Doppler beaming um, um, or even due to self lensing. So I'll talk about that um, perhaps at the end, okay? And uh, so first, let's look at this um, subgalactic black hole pair or dual AGN, if you will, with velocity-induced astrometry jitter, okay? So one, uh, one thing that is really a blessing here uh, is that we know that all AGNs vary, right? So the universal AGN variability uh, is a great tool and, uh, you know, illustrated by this several examples of AGNs, uh, optical light curves spanning decades, you can see this really stochastic variation, and probably uh, due to some accretion disk instability, such as due to a turbulent magnetic field. Although the, uh, the particular physical origin is still under debate, um, re regardless of that, we can still use this actually as a tracer uh, to identify a pair of uh, black holes that are otherwise unresolved. And uh, so this cartoon uh, illustrates the, the technique of this so-called varstrometry, right? So it's a mouthful, so we uh, give it a term um, to illustrate this variability-induced astrometry jitter. So the, um, you know, indeed astrometry has long been uh, useful for uh, super diffraction limit applications. And in particular, for our purpose, we can use this vastrometry to identify these uh, either a pair of black holes uh, or e even off center uh, black hole that is on its way um, to, the, to the host galaxy. So, this alternating, alternating brightness between a pair of quasars is very similar to seeing a real road crossing sign at a distance. Um, so as the lights uh, of both sides uh, of the stationary signal alternately flash, the sign gives the illusion of this jiggling, right? So the, the two black holes, they don't move at all, right? Because they're still separated by a few kiloparsec or a few hundred parsec. Um, but because of the stochastic variability, of one of both uh, components, you're seeing this uh, jitter and leveraging on this um, uh, signal, we have the vault gap project, which is uh, you know, applying this spectrometry technique to Gaia data because with Gaia's uh, you know, full sky coverage and great astrometry uh, uh, precision and accuracy, uh, Valdega really provides us with this large scale systematic search for dual AGN in the poorly explored subgalactic uh, regime. So the vastrometry signal uh, is detected by Gaia as this excess astrometric, uh, astrometric noise over their best fit astrometric solution, or even as parallax or proper motion that you wouldn't otherwise expect from these uh, stationary single quasars. Okay, so let me, uh, um, yeah, so, you know, if you, you haven't heard uh, about Gaia, I, I, I assume that since we have a really sophisticated audience here, everybody has heard of Gaia, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really a big surprise to me because recently there was this, um, you know, telescope tournament, I think initiated by, um, Ori Fox on Twitter, I believe. Um, and it, it, it turns out, uh, you know, no surprise that Hubble was one of the two finalists. Um, but guess who won uh, in the end between Hubble and Gaia? Any guesses? It's counterintuitive to say Gaia, so I'm gonna say Gaia. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Yeah, you you win, 
by the way. It it is it was Gaia actually. Uh, you know, even though it, it was a uh, you know reasonably close, like maybe a couple of votes out of uh, like a thousand, so it's a really close margin. But uh, but still, you know, it it really came out a surprise to me that you know like Gaia is really highly regarded. I, I think in terms of you know its influential science and. Not just in, I think, galactic science because uh, uh, you know typically Gaia is, is not considered like very useful for extra galactic. Um, but for our case, uh, you know, uh, I'm showing you examples of these Gaia selected, uh, uh, you know, dual agent, uh, dual and offset agent candidates. And uh, if you uh, combine that with uh, Hubble, so which I'm going to show you on the next slide you will see that in, indeed this vastrometry is, uh, technique is working, okay? So uh, again, the same, uh, same uh, systems, but now seen in the eyes of Hubble indeed. So these um, are uh, double or sometimes even multiple systems that are uh, producing this astrometry jitter. Now, um, so I'm gonna, highlight these systems on this uh, familiar diagram, hopefully already uh, showing the separation versus redshifts. Now we're um, you know, not just confined to the really low redshift uh, below 0.5, but uh, with Gaia, we, we are able to use the quasar population, which uh, you know, uh, due to their uh, luminosity function evolution, right? So a lot of them are uh, you know, actually uh, allow us to extend to higher redshift and be able to fill that gap uh, at subgalactic scales at high redshift where you would expect a lot of mergers to happen. So, and uh, indeed this, the red dots and stars are the ones that we found using this bastrometry technique. Uh, I should emphasize that these are still candidates because they're, um, it, it turns out you can have this uh, mixed bag of um, different types of systems, right? So you do have dual AGNs, but you also have um, small scale lensed quasars uh, where uh, you know, the time delay of the different images will also produce this astrometry jitter. You can also have uh, you know, offset AGNs uh, which could be due to the in, in spiraling supermassive black holes falling into a host galaxy. You can also have uh, interlopers such as star quasar uh, superposition. Even though we try to use colors to uh, reject them, but um, the bottom line from this is that follow-up observations are still necessary to determine the real physical origins. Okay. So so if you are on tag, uh, please give us time so that we can, uh, you know, really, really be able to, um, uh, you know, determine the origin and find the bona fide systems that, that are the real uh, dual or offset aging systems. Okay, so uh, I see that I still have maybe uh, five uh, minutes or so. So I'm gonna uh, spend the last five minutes on uh, another technique also using time domain signal. Um, and in this case, we are shifting gear to the really close in uh, binaries, right? So roughly uh, about a, a few or tens of milliparsecs where um, is that stage uh, immediately before the gravitational wave uh, emitting regime, okay? Um, but before I continue, any questions so far? I, th I think we'll just have the questions at the end, Jin. Yeah, that works. Yeah, that works great because um, I, 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 uh, I, I will only have a few couple more slides and we, we can, uh, we can end them. Great. Okay, so. Um, as I mentioned briefly early on. So circumbinary accretion disks um, are commonly expected around binary supermassive black holes. And the binary may exert uh, the strong torques on the gas. And uh, you know, as shown here as uh, two examples from uh, either 2D or three dimensional simulations, 
um, you can have, you, you know, you can plot the gas uh, accretion rate as a function of the uh, orbital um, uh, time, you know, divided by the binary uh, uh, period. And uh, you would expect to see this um, periodic modulations in the gas accretion rate. Now, um, if you notice that the uh, accretion rate modulation uh, is very different from you know, the usual science of the model that people uh, usually use to fit, for example, like exoplanets or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the usual periodic uh, candidates that, that you expect to see. And this is because this is a uh, you know, hydrodynamic effect. It's not a kinematic effect. You, uh, which usually ha has that uh, sinusoidal uh, modulation. Okay, and uh, uh, oh, and by the way, this this is this is usually called a sawtooth pattern, and uh, um, there there hasn't been any uh, you know direct evidence supporting this uh, sawtooth pattern, which, however, is uh, you know roughly uh, universally seen in a lot of these two D or three D simulations done by independent groups. Um, okay, so another scenario is Doppler beaming, which uh, has been proposed to explain the candidate periodicity seen in this uh, PG1302. It's a quasar, uh, and also I believe a blazar. So uh, again, so this is a kinematic effect with, with this uh, sinusoidal uh, shape expected from Doppler beaming. So uh, if you notice the data points with error bars, uh, you know, coming from different telescopes, um, really, you know, the well-measured portion only covers about one and a half cycles about this periodicity. And this is basically the main um, bottleneck of, of this technique, okay? And uh, the reason is, uh, you know, I, I think ha has uh, been perhaps uh, you know, largely ignored at first, but over the years has attracted a lot of attention in the community because of the increasing sample of these, uh, you know, periodic candidates. And, uh, you know, it, it's very simple. Like, remember the variability of quasars is a blessing for our uh, astrometry technique, but here is, is really a curse because, you know, this red noise, um, you know, property of the stochastic quasar variability can, very well mimic a um, periodic signal if you only have really few cycle um, observations, okay? So can you actually tell which one is um, real and which is uh, simulated? So one of this is uh, the observed light curve and uh, um, the other one is the simulated. Can anybody tell them apart? Uh, I cannot for one because uh, you know statistically speaking, uh, you know you 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 can uh, well have a uh, you know quasi periodic signal just from uh, random noise. You don't even have to have like a science model modulation at all. And this is again because of the red noise properties of uh, you know quasi stochastic variability. And uh, you know to uh, hope to try and solve this problem. So we have combined uh, the SDSS Drive 82, which is uh, you know, a roughly, roughly a 10 year uh, survey of this uh, stripe on the sky uh, with a um, uh, extended light curve from the dark energy survey. So particularly for this um, two fields that are highlighted down um, at the bottom. So the really unique thing about this, uh, this two small fields is that so they have this really long uh, but also high sensitivity light curves that um, can hopefully allow us to tell real periodicity from a red noise. Um, so uh, sifting through about a thousand quasars, so not a large sample because of the small field, um, uh, there was a previously a grad student but now a, uh, a postdoc uh, Dr. Wei Ting Lao um, has discovered this um, tantalizing, I would say tantalizing evidence for this uh, K 
characteristic sawtooth pattern. Like remember from the uh, hydrodynamic circumbinary accretion variability. So it seems that, you know, the light curve is, uh, you know, statistically speaking, better explained by a circum binary accretion model rather than, uh, you know, from the science of the model expected from Doppler beaming. Uh, but I should emphasize that, uh, again, this is, even though it's perhaps better uh, than some of the previous candidates because we have roughly five cycles uh, coverage of the period, um, but this is still marginal. I would say still marginal evidence because, um, so for uh, first, first off, you still need extended monitoring to really um, tell real signal apart from uh, red noise. Because uh, if you have a real periodic signal, right, so it will definitely build up with time, uh, but red noise, typically they will fade. Um, okay, and the second, um, because this is still like an indirect detection, you would definitely need um, complementary evidence such as, you know, multi wavelength follow ups that will allow you to um, rule out other alternative scenarios. I won't go into de de the details of these, but again, this is a really, um, uh, you know, resources and uh, observations intensive um, project. So, which actually highlights the fact that it's critically important that we don't fool ourselves by, uh, you know, barking up the wrong tree, right? Because uh, you definitely want to minimize your false positives from the get going um, to be able to uh, maximize the usage of follow-up resources. Okay, so this is my summary slide. So I won't read through them, um, but, um, you know, just to remind you, we, we've discussed uh, two particular techniques, um, both, leverage on time domain signals. One is vastrometry, uh, which is efficient for subgalactic dual and light quasars, particularly at high redshift. And the other is um, periodicity, which is a, a maybe a useful technique for these milliparsec binary candidates, but the difficulty or the importance uh, of this is that uh, you really need long-term and sensitive monitoring uh, to, you know, really zero in on the best candidates. Okay, so I want to, this is my last slide because I want to uh, leave you with something to look forward to. Um, so again, I'm organizing the um, upcoming facilities and surveys um, in the sequence of the mergers. So uh, I, again, I won't go into the details, but just to highlight two things. So first, I, I think the really highly anticipated James Webb will be uh, you know, even better for identifying smaller separation pairs at subgalactic scales. And uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight is uh, Ruben uh, you know, with the uh, LSST survey will be able to find uh, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of these uh, periodicity candidates. Uh, but again, uh, you know, really long-term monitoring is really key uh, to minimize false positives and um, follow-up observations are still necessary. So as you can see, this is really at the time to uh, enter into this this exciting topic and especially you know a shout out to the students in the audience so that's really capitalized on these exciting opportunities to finally break this subject open so great thank you so much jen so let's let's give jen a round of applause for this thank fantastic you talk. Um, it was very exciting work that you're doing and thank you so much for, for joining us. And we have quite a, an expert audience here. Um, so many of the people here not only do mergers but work exactly in uh, very related fields and we're on the list uh, of authors that you quoted here and, and are studying duels like uh, in fact my student Ryan Fifely who's here. Uh, and uh, many more people here working on duels. So let's open it up for questions. 
So I think someone had their hand up already. Oh, Sarah, you're here. Hi. <laughs> so Sarah, you, you wanna go first? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, this is my first time calling in. Hi, everybody, I'm Sarah. Um, thanks, Jin Lu. I, you know, I, I know your work and I think it's great. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering, so it's great to see that sawtooth source. So monitoring this source will take a long time, presumably to, you know, beat down the red noise and weed out the signal and be confident that you actually have a sawtooth signal. Although this looks, this looks pretty great. Um, do you know roughly how long it will take to be confident in your sawtooth, you know, like a, some number of sigma confidence? And also in the meantime, like, you know, this could be more, you know, another decade of monitoring. In the meantime, what do you think would be the best way to pursue this object? You know, pursue other observational proof, let's say. Yeah, great question. Thank you. So um, I, I definitely agree that, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very challenging. So for this particular source, it has a, uh, a period of roughly five years in the observed frame. So you would need at least, you know, if you take that five cycles, uh, you know, rule of thumb of the, that's only the minimum, right? So, uh, and uh, with the current data that we, we get, we are, uh, you know, barely hitting that uh, bare minimum. And if you can continue to monitor that for another maybe five or 10 years, that, uh, you know, at least statistically speaking, you can um, better try and rule out red noise as the main driving mechanism. Um, but again, I think um, to be able to really cover uh, the, the, the enough numbers of cycles, uh, I think the perhaps the best opportunity really lies in uh, you know, smaller orbital period binaries, which however, as I'm sure you know, will have uh, you know, uh, less of a chance of being detected because their uh, you know, decay, orbital decay time will be so uh, small so that you will really need a large enough sample uh, to discover them in the first place. Uh, so I think with uh, Ruben, the LSST is, uh, definitely possible to find uh, really strong evidence for robust periodicity. There was actually recently a uh, confirmed, I would say that's the only confirmed periodicity ever seen in quasars, um, is actually discovered by Assassin. And a part of the orbit uh, covered, uh, actually cover, happened to be covered in tests. So it's really um, exquisite uh, light curves um, ever observed, I would say. Uh, and uh, the number of cycles being covered was, um, uh, you know, I believe like 11 or 12. So um, definitely we, we know for sure that it's not just red noise, but that object uh, happened to be a partial, believed to be a partial tidal disruption event. So not a, a binary, uh, um, but, um, I think that highlights the fact that, uh, you know, like with a long enough uh, light curve and with high enough sensitivity, um, you can definitely expect to find periodic uh, quasars. Now, the second order of question is what's actually driving that periodicity, I think is, is still open, right? So there, there could be, um, you know, various uh, mechanisms, right? So including, binary, but also other uh, like a pre jet precession, for example, or, uh, you know, uh, um, eclipsing, maybe soft lensing, et cetera. So uh, I think, um, you know, to, to answer your question, I, I definitely, I'm, I'm really optimistic, uh, especially I think with the improvement of time baseline and uh, the sensitivity, I think in particular, um, there, there's gonna be a lot of uh, treasures you know, to, to be discovered in these, uh, in these surveys, yes. Great, um, so I think Christina was next and then Dave. Um, hi, um, uh, that was a really great talk. Um, really beautiful graphics and really nice demonstration of, of using um, barostrometry for, um, binary supermassive black holes. I was wondering about the figure you have on this slide though, 
the for the first evidence for a circumbinary accretion. Um, do you also find evidence for a circumbinary jet? And what um, kind of radio follow up are you working on? I see VLA is listed, but I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Christina. Great question. Uh, so for this particular target, we we had uh, uh, VLA follow up just to uh, you know actually is it you know is is a very simple uh, detection um, for this particular quasar. It's it's relatively faint, so there's not a lot we can do. But the idea is just to rule it out as a uh, blazer or a radio. Uh, bright um, quasar because, and the, the reason is again, very simple because um, for a lot of these other candidates, so the, the ones that, um, for example, that I, I highlighted here. So this, I'm, I'm sure you know this, right? So the, the, the original poster child of this um, binary candidate from quasi periodicity OJ287, for example, is a blazer, right? So it's, it's I, I think, very different picture that you have in mind when it comes to the optical periodicity. For this particular quasar, the leading model is that you have a, a creation disk surrounding the primary black hole, and you have a, a, a hundred times smaller secondary black hole that is punching through the accretion disk, producing this double picked uh, um, shape in the optical light curve. Um, but again, this, this particular quasar is, is a blazer. So we know that there is the complication due to the relativistic jet. So uh, I, I, I think, uh, and again, this, this particular case doesn't really fit into either the circumbinary equation model or the Doppler boosting model um, uh, to zeroth order. So it's, it's, it's again, it's a very um, unique but uh, I would say a strange source, uh, which we don't actually understand. Um, the other example is this this uh, this other famous um, uh, PG thirteen o two quasar. Again, is is um, I think borderline um, on the on the classification of a blazer. So it's also extremely radio loud. So we know that there is the complication due to uh, you know the contribution of optical emission from a relativistic jet. So for our um, candidate, our goal is just to rule it out. And indeed it, it's a, uh, it, it proves to be a radio quiet quasar. So we can uh, perhaps say that it's at least not due to the, due to the precession of a radio jet. So, th so that's okay. the, yeah, so that, that's okay. the bit of the radio follow up. Um, thanks, um, just, just one, one quick, thing uh, to follow up on that. It could be radio quiet at the moment you check it, but um, especially if we think of this interesting possibility of a, a circum binary jet being formed. Um, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. There could be extreme radio variability. And so the, the classification could change the presence of Doppler, you know, a, a beaming could Absolutely. Uh, be yeah. Yeah. And there. I, I'm, yes, One year and there's the next. <laughs> That's a, that's a great that's a great point, uh, and I am uh, fully aware of your recent paper of the you know the radio variability. I, I think that's that's definitely a possibility that we cannot uh, you know completely rule out at the moment. We will definitely need you know maybe multi uh, simultaneous monitoring perhaps, um, but I, I I definitely agree that it's indeed a possibility. Cool, thanks. It's an exciting time. Great, thank you, Christina. Um, Dave? Hi, thanks for the great talk, especially just bringing me up to date with some of the new methods that are being used. Uh, I just had a, a sort of, you know, since, since, since the studies you mentioned essentially survey, you know, thousands of quasars to find these candidates, does, do the fractions tell you something about, uh, you know, and I understand fully that they're candidates, so we don't know, for, for sure whether they're uh, uh, binary systems, but you know, if you took them as binary systems, are these fractions telling you something about the, um, the, the, the physics involved in, 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 uh, in coalescing in this case, right? For example, circumbinary evolution, how fast is it? Is it consistent with models for, for that evolution based on the statistics? Uh, and, and, and a small follow-up to, to that is, 
you know, if it takes, you know, tens of years to, for example, to, to verify, to, to even find candidates, is there a trade-off between larger surveys covering a large area of sky, but with lower amounts of sampling, or, you know, dedicated programs that just pound on uh, the small set of, of thousand or two thousand quasars and basically try to get a, a well sampled like over, uh, you know, an, another ten years, for example, is, is which would be the better approach towards sort of tying down those fractions? Yeah, thank you, thank you for the great questions. Um, so, David, I, I think you nailed the hat. Uh, you nailed it. You nailed it on, on right on the head because uh, you know the 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 final um, aim of these. Uh, various programs is indeed to constrain that abundance, you know, after criteria for selection in completeness, and to be able to say something about the accretion and dynamics of um, the merging systems, uh, you know, per perhaps also for the, uh, uh, you know, dynamic state of, of the um, circumbinary gas. Uh, and uh, it's it, it, uh, Particularly important, I think, uh, as I'm sure you know, because you know, in theory, uh, is is still uncertain whether you know uh, the gaseous process or the gravitational wave um, decay is driving the the final in spiral, for example. So uh, having a set of empirical constraints can definitely allow you to put, um, you know, I would say constraints that are complementary to uh, PDA limits, for example. Um, but the, you know, the difficulty at the moment, as you also pointed out in your second, the, the second part of your question is that, again, these are still candidates and we don't actually know, uh, you know, whether, whether these are, um, uh, you know, the, the system that we should put all of our resources to follow up. And I would argue that perhaps, uh, you know, a lot of these earlier efforts, even even though they, they you know they, they are very um, crucial in terms of um, you know really paving the way for the technique itself, but I think we really need to capitalize on uh, you know re a really large sample with long enough baseline and uh, high enough data quality to be able to really zero in on the best candidates to confirm. Because we, we really need to confirm at least one, I think, um, candidate before you can say something perhaps about their population properties. Um, and I think the best way to do so is, uh, as, you, as you also pointed out, that there is the trade-off uh, between, you know, going, uh, you know, going wide and, uh, you know, going just uh, a really focused search. But I think the good news is that uh, with Ruben, for example, right? So these large scale samples almost come for free. So um, I would say now the uh, real question is how you, you best allocate your follow-up resources to make sure that you don't, again, bark up the wrong tree, right? So, um, and especially I, I think important uh, for uh, minimizing false positives, right? So a lot of these early candidates, they actually turn up to be um, false positives in their follow-up monitoring. But but I think perhaps it's not surprising because you had only like 1.5 cycles to begin with. So you, you, you do expect to see a lot of false positives. So at the end, I think we really need to go back and uh, do the long-term monitoring for the full sample, right? So not just uh, for the few best candidates that you selected from the few cycle data, um, but for the for the full parent sample. And this is not just for potentially recovering false negatives, but also for really pinning down that abundance, right? So you can safely say for sure, for example, uh, what's the upper limit uh, of these uh, periodic candidates. Good stuff, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, uh, very nice questions. So does anyone else wanna ask a question? Can, or Christina, did you have your hand up again? I definitely wanted to ask some questions, but I 
I'm the host, so I, I, I go at the end. <laughs> um, I, I have a pretty, pretty simple question. Oh, Jeffrey, go ahead. Um, hello, thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, has there been any large scale surveys um, studying the, say, like, X ray luminosity and merger versus merger stage? Um, and can those studies be used to like constrain the shape of say like the X-ray producing region as the two black holes get closer and closer together? Yeah, yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, X-rays are, I think, definitely uh, very, very intriguing because you uh, you you can definitely imagine a lot of uh, you know uh, potentially discriminating signatures coming from the X-rays. Um, especially when, when you talk about, you know, the uh, really, really uh, high energy region close to a pair of black holes. Um, you know, I, I myself, I haven't really done any um, searches um, directly in the X-ray time domain regime. Uh, so there are models that are uh, predicting, for example, maybe uh, like a hard X-ray access from the uh, stream stream or stream wall collision of uh, you know when, when, when you have a certain binary equation right due to the binary torque for example you might expect to have this highly uh, you know non-thermal uh, emission component um, but I um, you know I, I think the the focus right so the theoretical focus has uh, relatively been focusing on for example maybe the the really final merger and coalescence phase or even after merger phase. So there is uh, nice predictions of X-ray flares, for example. Um, observationally, I, I think uh, it's extremely challenging. I know people have tried this, um, you know, uh, very, very recently, like really uh, interesting work, uh, but I, I haven't really seen, you know, like a real convincing case um, you know, building up from the X-ray perspective, I, but I but I think that that should definitely change with um, you know the availability of uh, you know hopefully upcoming uh, larger scale X-ray surveys and hope uh, even perhaps in the in the time domain that uh, you know has the sensitivity and the you know the cadence that are high enough uh, to be able to. Um, distinguish that from just the, rel the, the relatively mundane scenario of, again, just AGM flare, right? Uh, so I think that's, that's definitely a, uh, there, there's a potential there, yeah. So um, definitely something to think about, I would say. Yeah, great, thank you. Great, so I see that we're already at uh, one o'clock. So I think, uh, we can officially thank Jin and Jin, if you have some time to stay a little bit longer, um, it would be great if I just asked a little bit, uh, a few questions and anyone who wants to stay, feel free. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah I've really been enjoying these amazing questions. I should say thank you again um, to you know all the organizers for this amazing um, seminar series and uh, also for making this available, you know, just, uh, fully accessible online. So I think it, it will be really helpful, not just for uh, you know, practitioners in the field, but also for uh, involving more students. Uh, so thank you, thank you. Oh, great. And I should say actually too, for any students who are here, or if you have students, um, Jeffrey's leading a Discord server um, for specifically for students. So please join. And there are all kinds of ideas of student coffee hours and you know uh, talks practice tour talks and Jeffrey put a link in the chat mm -hmm. so um, feel free to join and, and recommend it to your students and it could be a nice uh, network networking opportunity and just uh, building building a support network of people studying AGMs so with that yeah. let's thank uh, oh, Jeffrey, you want to quickly oh, say? I was going to say, uh, yeah, it's it's. There's going to be some events for students. I was, I was going to say anyone can join though. Professors, researchers, postdocs, um, and I just put the link in the chat. So yeah, feel free to anyone to join and send it around to your AGN folks. Uh, I really want to spread this. So yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we're allowed to join too. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so great. So thank you so much, Jin. And if you can stay a few more minutes, that would be great. So let's thank Jin. One more time for this fantastic talk.